The Legend of Jimmy Spoon by Christiana Gregory, Chapter 3, Full Moon. Three weeks passed. Every morning, Jimmy met the Shoshone boys beyond town. He pretended they were members of the Jimmy Spoon Club, even though he didn't know how to explain this to them. Nampa and Gamu helped him mount the pretty horse, which he named Pinto Bean. Riding exhilarated him. Galloping with the wind and sun in his face made him feel free for the first time in his life. He liked the way the Indian boys let him take over, trusting him with the horse. Jimmy was unable to forget that they wanted him to visit their tribe, especially after Nampa formed another word picture with his hands. If Jimmy rode to the village to meet their chief's mother, the horse would be his. Jimmy pointed to Pinto Bean and pressed his hand to his heart, imitating Nampa. The horse would be his? Yes, Nampa nodded. The horse would be his. Jimmy felt a wild excitement. Maybe if he asked his parents, they would let him go. He could meet the chief's mother, then return home. And he could keep the horse. It seemed simple enough, although Jimmy was puzzled as to why she wanted to meet him. He also wasn't sure how far away the boy's village was. From their hand language, it seemed like it was about a two-hour ride. What Jimmy did know was how badly he wanted to keep Pinto Bean, and how he wanted to play with these boys all the time. He admired the ease with which they swung onto their horses, and that they weren't buttoned into hot clothing. He wanted to be like them, to run outdoors all day long. Jimmy was sure he could hunt and fish any time they want. Jimmy was sure they could hunt and fish any time they wanted. Wide awake, Jimmy listened to the snoring of his father and the gentle breathing of his sisters and mother. Moonlight streamed through the windows above the cupboard, illuminating the room. Lucy slept in a cradle by his mother's side of the four-poster. Burrowed into the bed next to the spinning wheel were his four younger sisters, Rose, who was two, Annie, three, Francis, four, and Emma, five. Clara and Molly were old enough to be wives, 15 and 16, but they seemed content living as daughters. They shared the trundle next to the fireplace with Nan, Jimmy's twin. During the day, their home bustled with activity and happy noises from the children, but an unspoken grief lingered like a cobweb in an overhead rafter. Olivia, the eldest sister, had married Thomas Messersmith last year and moved into a cottage across the street, but on, bright spring, but on a bright spring morning, Several months ago, Olivia had bled to death after giving birth. Jimmy's mother wept, but afterwards there was only silence. The tragedy was never discussed. Jimmy sat up on his cot. He liked his family. Sisters could be bossy, especially Clara, but overall they weren't too mean. But now that he'd tasted freedom with the Indian boys, his restlessness grew. He wished his father were a rancher instead of a shopkeeper. He lay awake until the moon passed and his mother rose to kindle the stove for breakfast. Candlelight revealed her leaning over the long, rough table with a rolling pin, flattening the dough that had risen overnight. Jimmy tiptoed across the plank floor and threw his arms around her waist. Oh, mother, he cried into her apron. He didn't know how to tell her the burdens of his heart or that he was sorry about Olivia. She set the rolling pin down and held him. Jimmy didn't move until he heard his father unlatch the door and walk across the porch to the outhouse. Mother, he repeated, looking up at her face. Her auburn hair fell to her waist, and he thought she had never seemed more beautiful. Many mornings he would rush to help her cut biscuits before his sisters awoke. He savored those early moments with her, and though it bothered him that she worked so hard, he wasn't sure how to help her move. Instead, he asked her about a horse. Do you think Pa will let me have one if I ask him again? I'll triple my chores, and I'll take charge of the garden and the milking, and fence fixing. If only he'd let me have my very own horse. All the other boys have horses, Jimmy's words tumbled fast. If only he didn't have to be in the store all day. He knew she was afraid of Indians, so he didn't tell her about Nampa and Gamu. He couldn't ask her about visiting the village. His mother sat on the bench and pulled him to her side. The candle on the table cast long shadows through the darkened room and made her face glow. When she whispered, the flame danced. You're his only son, Jimmy. He wants you to be like him, to take over the store when he gets old. She stroked his hair from his forehead. She stroked the hair from his forehead. He needs you. We all need you. Lucy fussed in her cradle just as his father came in from the yard, stretching the suspen suspenders over his shoulders. When he saw Jimmy sitting, he frowned. Chores, was all he said. Three women in long summer dresses admired the parasols hanging from a rafter. A man with mutton-chop sideburns rocked on his heels, examining a pipe. Jimmy's father smiled pleasantly at his customers. His hair was parted on his forehead and slicked to the sides with olive oil. 
a luxury item he sold for $1.50 per bottle. Red, white, and blue streamers were draped along the walls, and American flags with the 31 stars were clustered in the windows to celebrate next week's 4th of July parade. Soon, everything would be festive and noisy, but right now it was quiet, too quiet. The steady ticking, the steady tick ticking of watches under the glass case rose above the ladies' murmurings, and to Jimmy it was a dreadful sound. Minutes were passing. Father, he blurted. All heads turned toward Jimmy. He looked down at his boots. Can I talk to you, please, he said softly. In the back room, surrounded by ceiling-high shelves, Jimmy sighed the deepest sigh of his life. Mr. Spoon's thumbs were hooked in his vest pockets, his fingers drumming impatiently against the brown satin. He looked at Jimmy's chin when he spoke. If I've said it once, I've said it a hundred times, you will have a horse when you turn 14 years of age, not a day sooner. You are far too immature to have full responsibility for anything that requires so much attention. But father... Jimmy repeated, or Jimmy whispered, I'm 12. Surely 12 is old enough. 14, Mr. Spoon turned to leave the room. Not a day sooner. Jimmy hadn't had a chance to ask about meeting the chief's mother. Three nights later, when the moon was full, Jimmy slipped away from his sleeping family. I'll just be gone a day, long enough for them to miss me, long enough for them to miss me, he thought, long enough to earn the pinto. He was taking a chance that his father would let him keep it. Nampa and Gamu were waiting at the edge of town with their horses. Pinto Bean was adorned with a red blanket under an elkhorn saddle that had no stirrups. There were feathers in her mane, fastened near the cantle with a parfleisy. A square of deer hide folded like an envelope. It was beaded and full of dried berries and meat. Yup! The Shoshone boys shouted, and they were off, galloping across a dry riverbed north into the moonlit night. And that's the end of chapter three.